on this edition of The Self-Publishing Show. It's a blast interviewing people that know a lot more than you do. You know, it's twofold. One is it's a lot of fun and you make good friends for the most part. (laughs) And secondly, you're learning a lot. You know, it's like teaching. Publishing is changing. No more gatekeepers, no more barriers, no one standing between you and your readers. Do you want to make a living from your writing? Join indie bestseller Mark Dawson and first-time author James Blatch as they shine a light on the secrets of self-publishing success. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Hello and welcome to The Self-Publishing Show with me, James Blatch. I'm going solo again this week. Uh, You saw last week I was standing next to Mark in the conference hall at 20 Books in Las Vegas. Uh, he probably already had COVID at that time because he's come back with the virus and uh, it's uh, hit him quite hard. I think this variant has been hitting people pretty hard and so he's been laid low. Uh, we are giving him some time off. That's probably him emailing me though. shouldn't be doing that. Um, yeah, so it's just going to be me for today. We've got a couple of things to get through and then a really, really fun interview to come in a few moments time. Uh, Let me first of all say a big shout out to Daphne Garrison from Ohio in the United States of America. Daphne is our latest Patreon supporter. Uh, You can join the Patreon support team and get all those rewards that go along with that if you head over to patreon.com forward slash self-publishing show. Uh, We also have a blog release today, Friday, if you're listening to this on release day on using competition to drive success. You'll find that along with uh, our entire archive of episodes going back six and a half years at selfpublishingformula.com. Okay, there's not much else to say at the moment. We've just closed our first launch of Launchpad. If you've joined us on Launchpad, I'm excited for you. We're going to be going through that course together over the next few weeks and months. Our next course opening will be in January. That will be Ads for Authors. Uh, But until then, we will probably have a couple of live training events. We'll tell you about them when they pop up. Right. Time for our interview. And it is with Patrick O'Donnell. We've had Patrick on the show once before. Patrick was a cop in Milwaukee for 30 odd years, retired uh, maybe two or three years ago. I'm going to say maybe two years ago. Uh, I'm sure we get to that in the interview. Um, The real deal. You know, he was on the streets in a tough part of town. Uh, he was a sergeant, a desk sergeant then, um, and uh, talking to him, the stories are incredible. Um, the things he saw in everyday working life are beyond some of the things we even read about in books. And that's part of our discussion, actually, as to what you include in books and don't uh, include. Um, and another sort of side note is if you've been watching the series on Netflix on Jeffrey Dahmer, I know it's not everyone's cup of tea and it's quite a hard watch. It is a hard watch. Uh, in places but it's actually I think a really well done series particularly towards the end Um, well he was there just after those events and knows all the guys who are involved in that so we have a little bit of discussion about that as well Uh, but the big news for Patrick who does a lot of work in non-fiction supporting crime writers uh, when they want to check facts or they want to be more authentic you don't have to be 100% authentic the whole time we do write novels we discuss that as well but he runs a Facebook group called Cops and Writers which is a really good place to get some uh, knowledge from uh, working policemen from around the world not just in the US but here in the UK and elsewhere in Australia and you'll see uh, you'll get an, a pretty good set of answers to your questions it's a fascinating a set of threads in that particular Facebook group. But Patrick has gone back into fiction writing. He's been lured by Michael Andale and his publishing company to write some uh, police procedurals, very close to his own heart, I think, set around uh, Milwaukee area. And so that's been an exciting foray to, for him. They are, I think, launched at the time I'm recording this now. They weren't at the time that we were doing the interview, so they'll be available now. And you'll get the details from Patrick himself. So let's hear from Patrick, then I'll be back for a quick chat at the end. This is The Self-Publishing Show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. Patrick O'Donnell, Sarge. Can I call you Sarge? Welcome back to the show. Of course you can, and what an honor to be back. (laughs) Yeah, it's great to have you on here. And we spoke a while back when you were... Uh, producing books to help people write police procedural and get that stuff right or some advice on that and you run a great Facebook group 
where you can ask all sorts of questions about what happens if I stick a knife in and then <laughs> I say it was my husband to because uh, he wants to take the fall from me. What would how, how would the police know and stuff like that, which does make me worry about who's asking those questions. But you know, it's generally authors, right? Well, if your wife takes out a really large life insurance policy on you, like out of the blue, I yeah. would start worrying. Yeah, yeah. I would double check that as well. But we should say for people who don't know, you had thirty years, I think, in the in the force. Ah, uh, twenty five years. Twenty five years in Mil- was that? Were they all in Milwaukee? Yeah, it was all in the city of Milwaukee. I, you know, you start out as a cop, and on patrol, you know, work. I worked midnight to eight for thirteen years, and then I worked seven at night till three in the morning for four years. So after 17 years and nights, I transitioned over to day shift, which was eight at eight in the morning till four in the evening. And of course, you know, there was always overtime. You know, if somebody gets shot at, you know, three 30, you're not, yeah. you don't pack it up I'm and say, off, Hey, it's, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So those are loose guidelines. That's, that's the way I like to look at it. And if you got home on time, Hey, it's a bonus, you know, life is good. Yeah. How does that work for so many years working in the middle of the night through every night? I mean, how, how do you live? What did you do to do? When did you go out for breakfast? Oh, you know, it's funny you say that because when I worked midnight to eight, you know, I started as a police officer. Then after seven years, I promoted to sergeant. And as a police officer, a lot of times <laughs> the coppers, if you had a really rough night, you know, if you had a very like tragic incident or something like that, you'd go out for what we'd call a choir practice. And a choir practice is going out for drinks. Right. At eight o'clock in the morning. <laughs> so when people are going to work, we're done with work and yeah. we're heading out. It's like, it's a total flip flop. You know, it's like, okay, now my night is day and my day is night. And you had a bunch of cops wearing their blue uniform pants and sticky white t-shirts because you're wearing the vest all night and yeah. it's gross, you know, but we all look the same and we all. And you're, drink, and you're drinking at eight o'clock in the morning. So to, to, a oh, ca- absolutely. to a casual observer, it might not look great, but actually that's your, that's your eight o'clock in the evening, right? Yeah. And, you know, we were, and at the, there was taverns that catered to third shift people. Right. And, you know, it wasn't just cops. You would have firefighters, you would have factory workers you would have all kinds of a mix of people but it's funny you could always see the you could always notice the cops because they're always in the back with their backs to the wall and they could see everybody coming in you know we're, we're very very guarded and it's kind of a closed community so you know the, the 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 choir practices would happen uh going out for breakfast was a big thing too you know it's like hey let's go grab some breakfast you know before you go to bed i knew guys that would go to the gym right away when they got off of work i did that for a while but it just you feel hung over no matter how much you sleep or no matter what you do it's not natural for the human body is it no your body is saying hey dummy you should be in bed right (laughs) now you should be awake or you should be in bed i mean and it's tough on relationships because you know okay you want to be a good husband or you know father that kind of thing and when is most of the stuff going on? You know, it's during the day. It's not at three o'clock in the morning. Hey, let's go on a field trip, little Johnny, you know, at three o'clock in the morning. But speaking of field trips, I did get the chance to chaperone a lot of my kids' field trips because I wasn't working. Yeah. You know, I worked all night and I was dog tired, but at least I got a chance to do things that a lot of the other parents didn't, especially the dads. There weren't many dads like me. So, so that was fun. I enjoy that. I'll we'll ask you a couple of questions about your career, then we'll get on to talking what we're going to talk about. Sure, sure. Was there, in your 25 years, is there a case that you still close your eyes and see at night? You know, there's a few. And it's not like a who done it. You know, they're all homicides. And they were just unusually gruesome or horrific, you know, like, say a six month old baby. I had a couple of those where somebody killed their child. And then I had an older lady. She was probably in her early seventies and make a long story short. What happened was she was a very nice elderly lady that had a friend of the family they knew for years. And she, 
he was down on his luck. He was probably in his mid thirties, late thirties. He was kind of like a handyman and he wasn't finding work, probably drank a little too much and he had nowhere to go. So he was staying with her. And finally she's like, after a couple of months of that, she's like, you got to go. Either you find a job or you got to go, you know, you just can't couch surf here forever and drink beer and you know, live off me. So they got into a huge fight and he wound up killing her at eight o'clock in the morning. He hit her over the head with a frying pan a bunch of times then stabbed her. Like, I don't know how many times and hid the body in the basement over a bunch of boxes under a bunch of boxes. And the niece of this woman that just got killed called us at about six o'clock in the evening, seven o'clock in the evening. It's like, Hey, we don't know where, you know, whatever her name was. I don't remember her name. You know, this is not like her. So it's a missing, it's a missing person. And the 24 hour thing that you see, like in movies and TV, that's not real. You know, it, it's all circumstantial what's right. going on. So the cop gets there. He searches the entire house. He searches the garage. He searches the alley and he doesn't find anything. And he's a newer cop. And he was a little bit unsure of himself. So he called me. I was, I was the boss. So I, I respond and I talked to the niece and I said, well, does she have any urgent medical conditions? No, she's, she doesn't even take pills. She's very, very healthy. Does she have friends or relatives in the area? Yes, she does. Lots. Okay. Um, does she, is it unusual? She said, no, sometimes she goes out and sees her friends or a relative and she stays for a while. Does she have a phone? No, she refuses to get a cell phone. I'm like, oh, you're making this tough. Yeah. So I said, what about the guy that lives there? Cause I talked to him for a little bit and I'm like, eh, getting a weird vibe, but not nothing crazy. And we ran him. He had only been arrested one time. And that's when he was a teenager for shoplifting. So it's not like he was this big, bad criminal, you know, up to that point. And he didn't give us any reasons to suspect him for the most part. And I asked, you know, the niece, I said, well, we'll go through the house again. And I went through the house. I went through the basement. She was a very small woman. She was probably about four foot nine, maybe a hundred pounds. And she fit under all these boxes. We never saw her. And right. she, and for whatever reason, the blood wasn't like seeping out. We didn't see it. And I told her, I said, tell you what, if by, you know, I'm working till three o'clock in the morning, if she doesn't come back or you don't hear anything by like, say 10 o'clock, call us. I'm going to send a little army of cops over and we're really going to dig into this and we'll, we'll find her. We'll find her. And she says, I said, are, are you okay with that? And she said, yeah, perfectly reasonable. I'm like, okay, well, other family members come to the district Well, I'm in back typing a report and I can hear the commotion at the front counter. And this is about uh, nine, nine 30 in the evening. And the desk officer is taking, you know, the information I go up there and I, you know, everything that I just said, I told them and they said, we want more cops over there right now. And I'm like, you know what? Sure. Why not? So, and you know what, I'll finish this, you know, paperwork I'm doing. I'll be there in like 10, 15 minutes. So one of my coppers responded that. A couple of my coppers responded and they're like top notch, really, really good cops. And one of my cops is like, he calls me before I get there. He's, hey, Sarge, did this guy have like a gash over his head, like a fresh wound? I'm like, no, he didn't have anything like that. He said, well, he does now. Then you hear this literally this blood curdling scream. It was her kids and her grandchildren were over at the house, you know, like looking for her. What happened was after we left to look for this poor old lady, this guy dragged her up the stairs and rolled her in car a piece of carpeting and pushed her under the back. There was like a little deck off the back and he stuck her in there as he was pushing her under the deck, he hit his head on the deck. So that's where he had this like fresh wound over on his forehead. And I, to this day, I will never forget the expression on that poor lady's face. That will never leave me. Mm. God, you, you, you saw a sign of the world that I know some people listen to this right about, but few of us, I mean, I was a bit, I was a reporter on the beat, but we never properly went into crime scenes. We stood on the outside, the other side of the tape. 
I saw road accidents. You, They'll stay with me. You, but you tried to get in. I tried to get in. I did. <laughs> yeah. I honestly, I honestly, yeah, of course. I honestly felt I probably should do it at some point. I almost spoke to um, the local um, forensic pathologist and said, you know, could I go in one day under supervision? But just because I think it's we, it was sanitized for us a bit. But the reality right. is, and I, I wanted, but anyway, um, I never had that conversation and didn't do it. But I know it affects you, right? I mean, I saw road accidents. Oh. I saw bodies pulled out of cars, and that stays with you for a long time. Um, right. But uh, but if to bring it back to writing, I don't know where we go with this, really, because you don't, you know, the first thing you said to us was the really distressing, quite dark things, children and babies. And that's not really the stuff of most police procedurals. You're going to steer clear of that, aren't you? Yeah, I think there's certain things that you are going to steer clear of or kind of tiptoe around, you know, you know, like the death of a child, uh, any type of sexual assault, anything of that nature, you might somehow bring it up, but not graphically. Yeah. You know, you, you don't want to do that, you know, and, and especially, you know, in this world of triggers and all that, that's a very, very real horrific thing that you know it, it could totally send somebody over the edge if you've ever been the victim of you know one of those crimes you know like say a sexual assault or yeah i mean it's not to say a, not to say you shouldn't killed you shouldn't cover you know, these issues but you're right, right it's about it's about part of the visceral detail you that would be something that happened rather than the central plank of the story you're describing the scene that would be probably unpalatable to most readers and a bit of a shock right in that's again maybe you should get to know your readers you know when you're writing anything one of the like commandments i would think is know your readers yeah. you know know, know who you're trying to target you know it, obviously this isn't a fairy tale audience or you know a sweet romance or, you know or even you know like a cozy mystery you know yeah. that kind of thing you know it's not going to be in there or yeah you can put it in there but that'll probably be the last cozy mystery you're gonna anybody's gonna buy from you i mean it's dark, dark horror i guess would would potentially have that in so you've got to know exactly who your audience are which is a key thing with every every genre um and the other thing is don't kill dogs although i did notice that a fairly high profile netflix series which we just watched and i won't give it away it'll stop people watching it kills a dog in there and i think he no don't no. kill dogs just no because it's horror i mean it's the only thing people really care about they don't care about the people in these programs oh yeah because... people you could die left and right yeah. in the story but you know you, you bet you could hurt a dog and then nurse it back to yes, health and then he's that's fine. you know then they're totally fine you know yeah but, you, got, you got to be yeah, careful oof. even if a dog dies from natural causes how you handle that and that's um that's yes um, yeah, people are very connected to their pets there's no doubt about that yeah oh well it's it's, it's fascinating whether we're not specifically going to talk about that we have an interview in the can with you if people want to go back and listen to that which is all about poop procedures about the balance of authenticity and and so on oh it's a loud helicopter going over um <laughs> but we are actually going to talk about a bit of a a bit of a right angle career move well not right angle but a slight branch from where you thought you were going it's happened to you so why don't you just explain what's happened well it's funny because you know i started out i've written five but i've published five books and the last four out of the five are non-fiction you know, I'm trying to solve somebody's problem, you know, and entertain a little bit too. I mean, I tried not to make it so they're like super dry or anything. Like you inject some humor just so people aren't falling asleep while they're reading your nonfiction book. You try to keep it interesting and entertaining, but the, the main purpose is to solve somebody's problem. You know, it's kind of like podcasts, right? You're either going to entertain or you're going to solve a problem or you're going to do both, which is what you guys do. I think, oh, you know, thank you. you, you listen to a guest and you learn something, but you also have the banter between you and Mark and it's funny and it's, it's fun to listen to. It's almost like two friends, you know, that are having a drink together and you're just like, oh, this is cool. You know, it's just a little slice of, you know, on your commute to work or whatever. It's great. So, you know, the last two books that I wrote were the police procedurals, the cops and writers stuff. And I was still on the job and. I saw a need because I started getting immersed in the indie author community and I was going to, um, to conferences and people would just come up to me and well, you're the police guy, right? You're the <laughs> police guy. And I'm like, I guess so. Uh, sure. Yeah. And they were, it was all very good natured. They just had a question about X, Y, or Z and it was fun. I enjoyed it. And I'm like, okay, 
and there just seemed to be a need. So the last two books that I wrote were the cops and writers books. And those were police procedurals for writers, you know, getting your facts straight, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I was well received. And like you mentioned earlier, I had the cops and writers Facebook group where I have just a myriad of experts that can answer a lot of these questions for writers, or if you're just curious, you know, you don't have to be a writer. And I started the podcast, the cops and writers podcast, because I enjoy podcasts. I, I love listening to podcasts and I was in the writer community and I thought, well, I can help out more writers this way and have some fun. You know, it, it's, it's a blast interviewing people that know a lot more than you do. You know, it's twofold. One is it's a lot of fun and you make good friends for the most part. <laughs> and secondly, you're learning a lot. You know, it's like teaching when yeah. you're a teacher, you, that's when you really start learning. Yeah, you know, it, it, it works out great. If you so want to learn I'm something, it, teach it. Absolutely. So I am interviewing Craig Martell and Michael Anderley. Now, Craig, I, I've known through the years. You know, he's a good friend, great guy. He runs the 20 Books to 50K Facebook group and the 20 Books to 50K conferences. So, you know, I wanted to bring him and Michael on. I met Michael one time in an elevator at um, Samstown him and his wife were in there and I introduced myself and he doesn't remember. <laughs> He's, he doesn't like the social stuff like Craig does. You know, Craig is kind of the face of the group. Yeah. He's, you know, he runs the whole shooting match and he's got the headache of mm. doing that too. You know, that's, that's no easy undertaking by any stretch of the imagination. So I started interviewing these guys and it was one of my most popular, probably one of my best, I thought podcast interviews. And Craig had to go and take care of Stanley, the Arctic dog. And <laughs> I just started talking to Michael about publishing and, you know, books and all that kind of happy stuff. And he said, I really want to get into the crime genre because that's like red hot right now. You know, romances will probably be number one forever. Yeah. You know, it, it just seems that way. But the crime genre is really coming up with thrillers, mysteries, you know, all that kind of fun stuff. And he, we just started talking and before we know it, it's like, yeah, let's collaborate. And, bef and that's, and then boom, we're writing books together. Wow. So, so, the elevator pitch. Yeah. And I mean, that's, <laughs> the reverse elevator was, pitch. He was pitching. You for know, you. And when I started that interview, that was the very last thing on my mind is like, Hey, I'm going to write books with Mike Landerly. Yeah, you know, it's like, no, this is going to be a cool interview and I'm going to have some fun. And, you know, it's just putting yourself out there. Yeah. And you never know who you're going to talk to and you never know what's going to come. Yeah. Up. I mean, it's, it's one of the adverts for the conferences. Go to the go to the conference, because even if you think you're insular and shy, um, you will still talk to people and meet people. And some of those people could become friends for the rest of your life or lead on to a change in your career like this so that's definitely one of the things that we and we were we're recording this on the 8th of november two days i'm flying out and you're going to be flying i think down to vegas as well oh yeah i'll be there monday through friday yeah um so tell us about the books so we started talking and we we talked about the genre we talked about you know the tropes what people are you know want and are looking for and their crime books you know there's what there's mysteries, you know, the who done it, and then the thriller of, well, you know who done it, but you know it's the excitement of you know the climactic, you know, at the end. And there's something that's kind of missing that used to be popular, and I think it's gaining some traction again. And that's kind of like a cop opera, if you remember Hill Street Blues. Yes, loved Hill Street Blues, where it was, you know, Captain Ferrillo. And he's running this, you know, troubled you know, police district and all the characters that he has under his command. You know, you've got Belker that's always chomping on a cigar that, you know, he's the plainclothes guy that growls at people and bites them. But he calls his mom every day. Yeah, you know, he's totally a mama's boy. Eccentric. Yeah. Time, yeah. Yeah. And, you know, all the little mini soap operas between partners and all that. And. I also, we talked about Southland. I don't know if you've ever seen that. No, I haven't. I have uh, heard of it, yeah. Oh, it's great. It's a LAPD, and it's through the eyes of a rookie 
that's just starting his field training. And we, we talked and it's like, well, if we could meld all that together, that would be really cool. So that's what we did. Yeah. The first three books, it's called Bruce city blues. That's the series. And it's loosely based on what I've done. You know, most of the stories and all that has been stuff that has happened to me directly or like good friends. And what we're doing is obviously changing the names, places, sure. you know, all that kind of stuff to protect the innocent. And <laughs> so it's starting out with the first book is called field training. And as a new cop, that's how you start out is with field training and all the experiences and stubbing his toe and, you know, kind of fumbling through some things and some like life and death stuff right away that he was thrown into. And this recruit is a little bit different. He's a little bit older. He's 30 years old. He was in the army beforehand. He had some personal tragedy occur and he's just starting over new. You know, he, he was down in Louisiana. He was in the army. He's starting new in Milwaukee, Wisconsin as a police officer. So you're looking at it through his lens and it's not just him. You know, you have homicide detectives, you have other cops on the shift that don't like him. And sometimes he doesn't have, he has no idea why they don't like him. You know, that type of thing. And the policey stuff, you know, car chases, you know, chasing guys wanted for homicide, you know, hmm. yeah, real quick story. And it's, and I'll just give you a, a flavor of it. My first week on the job, you know, we get sent to a stabbing at seven o'clock in the morning and we're, my FTO looks at me and says, who is stabbing people at seven in the morning? This is crazy, you know? So they give a description of the person who was the stabber and we're about yeah a block away and we're starting to slow down. We're in a patrol wagon and sure enough, here's a guy running towards us with a white t-shirt covered in blood. Right. Butcher knife in his hand. Oh, yeah, they have like, the weapon still. So that was useful. Oh, yeah. For you. yeah and yeah. we're like, without thinking, you know, I jump out of the car, I draw down on him, and, you know, I tell you, know, like, stop, police. And we just locked eyes. And one thing to look for, and writers should be aware of this too, whenever you're handling a weapon, if it's a rifle, if it's a pistol, anything like that, your finger does not go on that trigger until it's time to make it go boom. It's yeah. always off and outside the trigger. That's one thing that just drives me crazy when I'm watching TV or a movie. I'm like, oh, this is terrible. Put get your finger off that trigger. You you it that's yeah. how accidents happen. You know, there's no such thing as an accident. So there was that split second, and I transitioned over to the trigger, and I'm thinking to myself, well, this is gonna be a quick uh, career. <laughs> this lasted a week, and I'm gonna have to kill somebody. And the guy, yeah, I think he saw the fear in my eyes, and we just locked. And he just dropped the knife and went face down on the ground. Wow. Yeah, and that's in the book. And my FTO you know, after he's handcuffed, he looks at me and he's like, This usually does not happen. Usually they're running the <laughs> yeah. other way. They're not yeah. running toward this guy was just like with a shot the knife just covered in blood. Yeah, exactly. At least yeah, there was no like, ambiguity about who done it. Yeah, that's almost every homicide I've been to. Yeah. Where in I reality. Worked. Yeah. Yeah. You didn't need Columbo or Sherlock Holmes to figure these things out. You know, no, it's no. just it wouldn't be yeah. so readable that um Funny enough, when we were in, we had a summer holiday with family in California and uh, Arizona, Mexico, actually, in the summer. And one of the things I wanted to do, I, I've shot guns a little bit in the UK when I did some RAF training and shot the, the Browning pistols and a bit of an automatic rifle, but a long time ago, and I don't really know what the procedure are. And I just thought, I asked the kids if they wanted to do it. They're both teenagers. They yeah. both said yes. I thought it'd be a good thing for me to learn a bit about weapons handling today because you end up writing about this stuff. And so Absolutely. I phoned a range up in Arizona and I said, look, we're a British family. And of course they were as welcoming as you'd imagine they were. They said, yeah, come on, we'll, we'll give you a, you know, give you a 20 minute session in the, in the range, mm -hmm. talk you through everything, hundred rounds each, choose your weapons. And so we did all of that. And, and you're right. Cause it, the guy said to me, cause of course my finger goes immediately on the trigger. He said, so your oh. finger, he showed me where to rest my finger along the yep. side barrel, but it's not intuitive at all. And your finger keeps wanting to go back to the trigger because every toy yes, gun does. you've played with as a kid, you go straight to the, the trigger. But that's a small detail that is important. I mean, uh, we can argue about how much authenticity needs to be in these stories for them still to be readable and entertaining, but it is, it, it takes some people out of the story if they notice those details are wrong. It'll take them out immediately. 
you know, if, you know, one of my friends, Jerry Williams, she's a retired FBI agent and she's got a great podcast. Mm. It's FBI, you know, spoken to Jerry. She's brilliant. Yeah. Oh, she is. She is. Yeah. We have an interview with her in the archive as well, which is really worth listening. Yes. Yeah. She's, she's fabulous. I absolutely love her. And one thing she does is rate FBI, like TV shows and movies and all that. And there's the latest one is rookie FBI agent or something like that. There's it's kind of loosely based after the rookie that's on TV now. Yeah. It's, he's an older guy that's, you know, on LAPD. And now they have like the federal version, the FBI version. She said after five minutes, I couldn't watch it anymore because this lady's like in her forties, the cutoff to get into the FBI was like 31. Right. And she said right away, they didn't do their homework and this is ridiculous. Yeah. So they lost, a, you know, somebody watching. I mean, who, who knows if it'll last yeah. or not or how many uh, people they lose, but you don't want to lose anybody. And I think, I, I do think the thing, my takeaway with Jerry's chat is, is, don't fall into the unless you really really have to for the story don't fall into the cliche of having fbi versus local law enforcement because she yes. said 99 times out of 100 the local law enforcement are pleased to see the fbi turn up because you know these are complex cases they don't have the resources and this is what these guys train to do they also quite enjoy working alongside them but 99 times out of 100 on tv when the fbi turn up local and law enforcement are all up in arms about it yeah. and don't cooperate <laughs> and hate the fact that these feds have turned up and it's i get a kick out of that because if the feds showed up to any of my scenes and wanted to take over i'm like bye yeah see you guys <laughs> yeah. Now, you want this pa- it's Patrick? all yours baby where does sarge go <laughs> yeah no, he's, he's you know, having his that, choir for Quadrants. nobody plays hot potato with a crime you know it's yeah. it's okay is this under the jurisdiction of a federal crime you know like say like bank robberies right. or kidnappings you know like a bank robbery in the united states you know the money is uh insured by the federal government so it's technically a federal crime when you rob a bank does that mean an fbi agent or a team of them is going to respond to your location no not at all you know especially in a big city now in smaller cities where they don't have the training or expertise, they may not. But in most large cities, their uh, robbery um, guys or gals have the reps and they know what they're doing. Now, could there be an FBI agent that responds a little bit after, especially if you're crossing state lines, if this is a trend, you know, this is like a crew that's hitting all these banks or you know god forbid they start hurting people you know they Mm -hmm. start shooting people because most bank robberies are quote-unquote peaceful you know Mm -hmm. it's a demand note or they'll Mm -hmm. just say give me the money Mm -hmm. because they know the tellers are trained to just comply with whatever they want it's not worth their lives you know and it's you know it's insured it's not worth eating a bullet and the bad guys know that you know most bank robberies are pretty anticlimactic to say the least you know a guy comes in with a note and hopefully he leaves it there which is really funny because you know it's got dna a bit of evidence down there yeah they just they just leave it and it's like okay we've had guys leave their bags that they were gonna take the money they were so nervous right or my favorite is they're walking down the sidewalk and the dye pack goes off and they're like Uh, orange or green they're covered in this stuff you know I, i stopped one guy who just robbed a bank and he says, what? And I'm like, dude, really? Come on. You know, <laughs> stop it. So, yeah. And, you know, you see on TV and it's like this small army of FBI agents. Mm. No, mm. you're lucky to get one or two. Yeah. But that it doesn't work like that. Those authenticity things. Now, tell me about the writing, Patrick. So it's been a while since you've written fiction. And you're more experienced writing nonfiction. How did you approach it? Did you plot and plan? How much say did Michael have over this? You know, one of the great things about working with Michael was, you know, writing is kind of a solitude thing and, you know, you're going along with a story and you're like, Hmm, I wonder if this is going the right direction. You know, the doubt monsters kind of creep into your head and it's like, Oh, is this any good? You know, it's like, Oh, am I going the right direction? Should I add a little more of this? Well, I got a partner now. And it's amazing that I can, you know, just phone them up or do a zoom call and we talk about it. It's like, well, I think the character should be doing this now. How about let's try that? You know, and it's like, wow, that's really cool. Yeah, you know, I use plotter. I like plotter. And I have, <laughs> I guess I'm a pantser slash 
as Joanna Penn would say, discovery writer. Yes, I do prefer it, that yeah. expression, I have to say. Yeah, well, I guess what, in England, uh, uh, pants are something to do with underwear? Yes, we wear pants yeah. underneath our trousers. But um, I, I do appreciate okay. it doesn't mean that in America. But yeah, <laughs> still, let's let's go with Discovery Writer. But yeah. Yes. So I, I'm a bit of a combination. Like, I'm really rolling along. I wrote the first book got written probably in about a month and a half. Second book about wow. the same. And we're we're chugging along. So you're you're, you're I, churning out the words, Patrick. How many hours? Not have... all of them, but a good chunk of them. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, good chunk of them. Yeah, you know, my average writing day is about eh, one to two thousand words a day, and if you okay. do it every day, yeah, yeah, you know, like I was just in Boston, babysitting, well, dog sitting for my daughter. She she went off to a bachelorette party in uh, Disneyland, and you know she said, "Could you watch uh, my dog?" And I'm like, "Yeah, sure. What the hell? I'll hang around Boston." And <laughs> Yeah, you know, I of course I brought my computer. I was writing on the plane going there. I was writing last night on the flight back. You know, every day I would try to you know have some time for writing. You know, as long as you as as long as you can squeeze that in every day. Yeah, boy, the, the results are great. You don't need a NaNoWriMo or anything. I mean, I understand NaNoWriMo, and some people kind of need that kick in the trousers, as you would say. Yes, but the ass. Uh, in the arse, well, yes. in the arse. But I, I think, I mean, I'm doing nano at the moment. And it's, yeah. it's come at a point for me where I have been trying to develop a writing procedure or process that's going to work for me. Because I am slow and I will go through weeks or days with not, not writing. Just, you mm. know, it's easy for me because I'm clouded with stuff every day. on a long list at any one time I'm working through. Oh, sure. So it's easy for me to prevaricate and put it off. But I've also read this book, Atomic Habits, which Lucy School yes. recommended to me. and It's a great book. And NaNoWriMo's come along, and I'm now day eight into it. And every single day, I've got up in the morning, before I've opened my email, I've done a writing sprint of 25 minutes, which okay. gets me 750, 800 words done. Then Perfect. at two o'clock every day, I do a writing sprint. Either we're doing them in our group for this month or with my friends on WhatsApp. That means I'm 1,500 words in. Oh, out of, out awesome. of habit, out of just a habit now, which yes. feels to me very sustainable, long beyond NaNoWriMo. I'm doing a little bit more in the afternoon to make sure I do definitely get up to my sort of 17, 1800 words. But but that if that will be transformative for me, if I can keep doing that for my writing. Yeah, you know, I I do the discovery thing until I get stuck and then I start plotting. Yeah. Yeah, I okay. kind of go back and forth. You know, that's and the more I'm doing this, the less I need to plot. And the more it's just coming to me, you know, like the first book, I think I, I plotted the entire thing first. And then the second book loosely and the third book, I'm just cruising right along. And this, uh, this thing we are, the, the crime writers ask themselves about how slavishly you should follow real life. I mean, your cases would have taken weeks, months, years to the, the, the big ones that are going to make a book to actually happen. And in reality, we always, you know, TV shows and books compress this period down and they play a bit with with whose role. It, so you have your main character doing lots of things that perhaps in real life would be another expert's job. How much of that are you finding easy to compromise with because you are so immersed in the reality of it? You know, the way I'm doing it is the character is a street cop in a very busy district in a very probably the most dangerous part of town working at night. So there's always a new thing every night, you know? So, and that's the way I'm writing it because the way it works is I, you have detectives for homicides, you know, like the guy running at me with a knife, you know, blah, blah, blah. Homicide detectives showed up to that. You know, they have to take care of, they'll go to the autopsy the next day. They have to do the next of kin notification, all the follow up, you know, and then the guy who actually did the stabbing, they have to do the interview or some people call it an interrogation, you know, even though, you know, you, we had witnesses. Yeah. He just stabbed his friend over. I think it was the last beer or he was cheating at cards or something incredibly stupid. And he stabbed him in the armpit and, you know, cancel Christmas that will kill you. And <laughs> I, uh, you do that. And then the next day on to the next thing, you know, yeah. as a, as a cop on the street, you don't have that luxury of, okay, well now we're going to investigate this for yeah. you know, a week. 
It doesn't happen. And that's not going to work the, in a book unless it's like a diary. Right, exactly. So the way I'm doing it is, you know, okay, this officer encounters this. This is what's going on, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And like I said, it's kind of like a cop opera where, you know, how does he feel about this? How is it affecting him? You know, he's brand new. You know, this is, wow, this is crazy. You know, he never expected this, you know, and all that good stuff. And then the next day, it's something totally different. You know, it's, <laughs> yeah, every day, every night, usually you had something a little bit different. You know, after a while, things started kind of clumping together and it's like, okay, yeah, been there, done that, that kind of thing. But in order to keep the readers going, you know, it's like, okay, you have a homicide. I'll, I'll switch it over to my detective. You know, it's like, okay, the detective is doing X, Y, and Z, and there'll be some chapters in what the detective is doing. And he's going home after sleeping for two hours. You know, he's, I mean, he goes home, sleeps two hours and goes back to work because that's what homicide detectives were. I don't want to say required, but if you say, you know what, I'm really tired, you know, union contract would say you have to have eight hours between shifts. You could take off, but if you're a homicide detective, that happens quite a bit, then you're not going to be any good to your unit, mm. you know, with your teammates, if you're constantly taking off because you don't have eight hours between shifts, well, then you're going to be doing property crimes. You know, they'll, it's not a demotion per se. You get paid the same amount of money. You're a detective, but it's, it's almost, it's not required, but you know, if you want to be on this elite unit, if you want to be doing this, then, you know, there's peer pressure. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and then same thing with the cops, you know, like I've worked 20 hour days. I've worked more than 20 hour days. And then, you know, I had like maybe an hour between, you know, I started work at midnight and I got done at 11 o'clock the next night. Wow. And I, I worked straight through and I slept in my car or I tried to take a nap in the locker room and I went back to work and worked another eight to 10 hours. Wow. But if you keep taking off after something like that, then people, A, they're going to think you're a little bit weak. Yeah. And B, they're going to be like, well, now we're shorthanded. That's dangerous. You don't want to be shorthanded. And say somebody's working your car and they get hurt or God forbid something worse. How are you going to feel? Yeah. So, you, so, so you've had to balance this. Yes. Yeah. Which is, which so, is the job of every police procedural writer. Right. I, I hope it works. <laughs> yeah. We'll see. Uh, the ultimate uh, tell, tell judge us, is the, the buyers. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Tell us what the books are called and uh, <clears throat> when are they out? I know we're going to try and release the interview to coincide with that. Yeah, Brew City Blues is the series. And the first book is Field Training. Now, one of the things in this book that readers are going to see that's a little bit different than uh, other police procedurals is I get technical. Okay, the reason why he, this officer did this is because of X, Y, or Z. The reason why the detective can't interview this drunk guy is because he's drunk. He's intoxicated. It'll never hold up in court. Right. You know, that's another thing you see on TV. And it's like, no, yeah, yeah. if this guy just got done boozing it up, you know, he's on a 24 hour bender and he's, he's so drunk, he could barely stand off to your little <clears> cell. <throat> you go and you're going to sober up before I'm going to talk to you because that will never fly in court. Yeah. You talk. You spoke with my defendant. He didn't even know what day it was. He was mm. so drunk, you know, that kind of thing. So I'm, I'm kind of putting the reader through a little mini field training of their own through all these stories. And, you know, it's not, and of course there is a story, you have a main character and one of the things with like thrillers and all that, they kind of have like this, this past that haunts them, you know, that kind of thing and that's going on as well. And his personal life. He's divorced and he's kind of getting back into the dating pool. The second book is uh, probation. You know, when you pass field training, that's 12 weeks. Right. Uh, uh, you're six weeks with uh, one field training officer on a shift. I did my first six weeks on late shift. Then I did my second six weeks with a different officer on early power, which was 11 in the morning till 7 p.m. So same district but different people, different hours, different shit. You know, they want to mix it up for a mm -hmm. new guy. And then after that, you're on probation. 
And the thing about probation is you're kind of walking around on eggshells because it's really easy to fire you. There's, you don't have a lot of protection or recourse while you're on probation. So the, you know, the big thing was like, ah, you're on probation. You know, you, you got to make sure you're, you know, squared away because if you do something even kind of bad or, you know, you make a huge mistake, ugh, it may not work out so great for you. Yes. Yes. It's a lot tougher to get rid of somebody that is off probation. You know, then there's certain protections that are in place. So the second book is probation and that's not as technical. Uh, what my goal was is to also educate the reader as we go along and you're having fun reading this story, you know, you're subliminally learning the jargon, you're learning the whys and hows and all that good stuff. And then, um, yeah, the first book is field training. Second book is probation. And the third book is choir practice. Ah, excellent. So the third book is going to get a little more into the, his personal life. You know, every book is going to have police stuff. There's going to be chases. There's going to, you know, foot chases, car chases, you know, all kinds of good stuff where I'm trying to be as realistic as possible and putting the reader behind the wheel of the squad car. You know, it's like, okay, this is how it feels. This is, you know, I'm trying to do my best with that. And then just, okay, now you have a partner. What's the relationship with your partner? You know, in bigger cities, they still have two, we call them two man cars or two person cars where it's two police officers in a squad car. And that's usually like in the roughest part of town, you know, at night. And I always, I had a partner, but that didn't mean you're always going to work with your partner. You know, people are on vacation, people have babies, people have, you know, there's all kinds of stuff where life gets in the way, you know, or you're going to be by yourself then, but you still have a partner. So I kind of go over the evolution of the partner stuff and the choir practice stuff. I even throw a little bit of like internet dating. Some of the hiccups he's had along the way, you know, trying to get back into the, trying to have a little bit of a love life and just oh, <laughs> that that part is funny I, I i laughed out loud when i was re sounds when good. i was writing that what is the re release schedule first book field training is november 18th second book probation is going to be released december 30th and choir practice is going to be released i think mid-february okay how exciting for you Oh, it, you know, I, I, I can't thank Michael enough. This has been so much fun and it's a huge opportunity to work with him and his team. You know, it's like, okay, we need a book cover. Yeah. We'll talk to the book cover, you know, designers. Yeah. So and you're basically like, their Whoa. big publishing empire, aren't they? In fact, I'm having dinner with them on Monday night. So, I mean, they're, they're, sort oh, are of, you? yep. They're a publishing company that invites people to have dinner with them. That's what sort of publishing company they are. So they have all that stuff, all the editors, you, you're the writer. Oh, yeah. You're the writer. What a luxury. You know, it's amazing to me because, you know, but you're trying to navigate around. It's like, who should I talk to about what? Yeah. You know, because it, and he does it well. And his staff by far is some of the nicest people I've ever dealt with. They're like, are you okay with that? You know, it's like, we want to make you happy. And I'm just like, really? And, you know, I'm not going to discuss terms or anything like that, but he is more than fair. And it's just been a real yeah, it's been awesome. I, I can't say enough well, good things about it. Can't wait to see the books and uh, to wish you all the success with that. Now, before we go, I do want to ask you a little bit about Jeffrey Dahmer because we're all talking about him again. <laughs> he's, he, I was going to say he's raised his head, but that's not not the worst thing to say about him uh, because of this series, this mini series on TV. And um, you were a Milwaukee cop during that entire period, during the sort of three or four years that he became active. Nope. Are you? I heard? missed it. Oh, you I missed did? it. Oh, I thought you were there. I missed it. But 1995 is when I started, and I think Dahmer was 92 or 93. Oh, okay. But you knew the guys, right? So you were there oh, yeah. in I knew, the team. I knew the officer that found the head in the refrigerator. Right. Yeah, I, that's something you don't forget. <laughs> no. Next to the salad. <laughs> yeah, and what I find interesting about this Netflix series is, A, it's not 100% factual. Mm -hmm. Some of it's not even close, but that's Hollywood. You know, you, you, you know, don't watch that and think, oh, that's exactly how everything happened. No, it's not. But what I find interesting though, is younger people are interested in this. Mm. Yeah. You know, I, I, um, one of my son's best friend's sister that goes to college by us, my wife and I took her out to eat, you know, a couple of uh, weeks ago, you know, she's a freshman. She doesn't know a lot of people. It's like, yeah, let's take her out to eat. So 
the first thing she asked me, she said, well, you were a Milwaukee cop, right? And I'm like, yeah. Did you know the Dahmer stuff? And I'm like, how do you know about Jeffrey Dahmer? Mm. You're like 19 years old. And she's like, oh, we're all watching it on Netflix. It's so cool. And I'm like, you and one of her roommates was with her. He's like, that, I can't believe this stuff. And I'm like, you guys are interested in this? Like young people are. Yeah. I, I, that I was surprised by. Yeah. It's well, I think the series is well done. I, I take your point, of course, but always the case, but they'll um uh they'll deliberately get some stuff wrong, maybe accidentally as well. But I think I thought the series it started off where it was a little bit saggy in the middle, maybe like an yes. series of, but I thought the last four episodes or so were superb um of that. And quite I thought they they were pretty hard on the police. There was it was yeah. a bit, it was a bit black and white in terms of the way they portrayed portrayed that. And I wondered if you would react a little bit to that maybe, but well, what's interesting about that is I know two out of the three officers that were fired in, initially, and I talked to them about the story, about what happened. You know, so I'm getting it from the horse's mouth. The other officer that was fired went to a smaller town. They picked him up right away, and he stayed there, and he retired out of there. And the other two, what happened was the chief fired them without any kind of due process you just mm. can't fire cops because we're in a position where you have to make decisions in a split second that will impact you and other people the rest of your life or the rest of their life mm. you know so there is some wiggle room that way but they got caught up in the politics yeah and you got to be careful with that because you know you should just be fair and do it the right way that's and if you i mean that's something i guess for life you know well, it cost but, the chief his job didn't it in the end not really no? he the chief left towards the end and he was kind of a joke he he wasn't a very good chief and he was more or less the mayor's puppet right because you know like a sheriff is an elected official you know in in the united states the sheriff you know has there's an election and the people elect the sheriff now a police chief especially, you know, like in a big city, they're appointed by like a fire and police commission or some entity like that. And the people, the fire and police commission are more or less handpicked by the mayor. And if these people want to stay in the fire and the police commission, okay, the they're going to do whatever the mayor tells them to do. Yeah. So it's, it's the dirty world of politics. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. And you know, the mayor was outraged because his constituents were outraged. So let's get rid of these guys. Long story short, they didn't do it the right way. The cops sued. They won. They got their jobs back with back pay and a huge settlement. Cost yeah. the city a lot of money. And the, and the, uh, the mayor was run out on a rail, more or less. Yeah. So well, I need, I need, uh, <laughs> you'd have something to say because you were, with those people, I just wanted to ask you about that. And uh, by the way, yeah. I think you should go for sheriff. I can see you as a sheriff. When you <laughs> you said you think about moving south, you go to a south, southern town in Nevada or California. You could, you could be a western town sheriff. Well, you know, I've ridden horses before, and I was thrown from one once. You know, so, so you're not doing that again. Well, no, when you're sheriff, I like horses, but yeah. when you're sheriff, you can you can ask a sergeant to ride the horses for you. Yeah, or I'll just stay in the squad car. I'd like to see you fine. with that silver badge. Um, look, Patrick, <laughs> we've we've run out of time. It's been brilliant talking to you. Thank you so much indeed for coming on. Really, fingers crossed for the release. Uh, I so Thank look you. forward to seeing how see them out in the wild. And I'm so happy for you because it's been, um, you know, you're somebody who contributes a lot, I think, to the indie community. And to suddenly see you as a writer in the stable of uh, LMNBP, and I can never remember the name um, of Michael's company, is is amazing, actually. Quite a surprise. So I'm I'm excited for you. Yeah, we'll see what happens. I, I hope they sell well. You know, it's like that's a little extra pressure because you want to do well for somebody yes, that's giving from, you a chance. Yeah, yeah it's right like yourself, yeah. exactly, exactly. Oh, but I just want to say thank you for having me on the show. You know, it's always so much fun talking to you, James. Hey, and we'll have a beer next week. You can tell me all the yes, secret will. Dharma stuff next week. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thanks, Patrick. All right. Thank you so much. This is the self-publishing show. There's never been a better time to be a writer. There we go. There is Patrick O'Donnell, my friend uh, from Milwaukee. And uh, we caught up with Patrick. Funnily enough, uh, we recorded an interview with John Logston. And then we recorded the rap 
in Vegas. Thought, well, we'll just record the top and tail in Vegas, which you saw last week. And after we finished it, John Logsdon walked up to us. Well, Patrick O'Donnell was also there at 20 Books in Vegas. Um, so it was nice to catch up with Patrick. I didn't see enough of him, actually. We had a tremendously busy week. But nonetheless, uh, it's a great He's a great person to have in our community. I think somebody, the real deal, you can tell from just the stories you hear from Patrick uh, about what he's done. You get some very authentic sense of what it was like to be a policeman uh, on the beat, which might be important for your writing. Uh, even if you don't write police procedurals, we have a bit of cops in most of our stories, don't we, one way or another, even if they're space cops. Well, very good luck to Patrick and his books uh, with Michael Andale's uh, Publishing Empire. It's good to catch up with Michael and Judith, of course, in 20 books as well. That's it for this week, for just me. Hope it was all right. Uh, Mark, I'm sure, will be fully fit and back and fighting at fighting weight uh, for next week's podcast. But until then, all that remains for me to say is a goodbye from me. And that's it. Get show notes, the podcast archive, and free resources to boost your writing career at selfpublishingshow.com. Join our thriving Facebook group at selfpublishingshow.com forward slash Facebook. Support the show at patreon.com forward slash selfpublishingshow. And join us next week for more help and inspiration so that you can make your mark as a successful indie author. Publishing is changing, so get your words into the world and join the revolution with The Self-Publishing Show.